Hello, everyone. Hello, um, and welcome uh, to Mark Stevens' uh, exciting expert lecture on uh, cryptology. I'm uh, really excited for the subject. Uh, I believe in the first week of teach, uh, teaching, uh, one of our experts uh, already gave you a brief crash course in um, in uh, how to uh, engage uh, in cryptology on the ground level. And I'm uh, really excited uh, for uh, uh, Mr. Stevens uh, to provide a continuation of the subject and uh, to further uh, deepen your expertise in uh, uh, cryptology. Uh, before uh, we uh, move on uh, to Mr. Stevens' lecture, uh, let me uh, give uh, Mr. Stevens' uh, introduction uh, so that uh, you're uh, familiar uh, with his background. Uh, Mr. Uh, Stevens is a permanent researcher in cryptology at uh, Centrum Wiskunde and Informatica in Amsterdam, the Dutch uh, National Research Institute for Mathematics and Computer Science. He obtained his PhD in 2012 from the Mathematical Institute at Leiden University, uh, for which uh, he was awarded uh, the KHMW, the Royal Holland Society of Sciences Martinus van Marum Prize. He's an expert in uh, cryptanalysis uh, with emphasis on practical attacks on MD5 and SHA1. And uh, his research highlights are the construction of the MD5 Rogue uh, Certification Authority, IHCR annual flagship crypto conference 2009, uh, where he was awarded the best paper award, the invention of counter cryptanalysis, and the reconstruction of the cryptanalytic attack in super malware flame uh, crypto uh, 2013 best young uh, researcher paper award and uh, finally the achievement of the first collision for full sha1 uh, for which he uh, received the crypto 2017 best paper award and uh, the black hat USA 2017 Puini Award for best uh, cryptologic attack. With that, sir, uh, I would like to yield the floor to you. Uh, hugely excited uh, for your uh, showcasing of uh, cryptology expertise. I will uh, mute myself for now, but uh, if there's any technical issues, uh, I will be here uh, to help with uh, troubleshooting. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, at the moment, I only can see my own slides. So if there are any pressing questions popping up, then maybe you can uh, raise them. Uh, because I, I, I'm currently won't see them. So maybe afterwards, after my, my lecture, I will close my slides and maybe I can then also see uh, questions. Uh, indeed, uh, I encourage uh, all our students to uh, drop their questions in the chat. As usual, I enabled the chat for uh, this lecture also. Um, and uh, Mr. Stevens opened himself uh, to a brief Q&A session in the end. Uh, so uh, we'll have uh, five to ten minutes uh, to go through uh, as many of your questions as possible. OK, thank you. Then, then uh, uh, let's start. So uh, as introduced, I'm uh, Mark Stevens, a researcher at the National Research Institute uh, in the Netherlands for Mathematics and Computer Science in the cryptology group. So my main research focus is uh, cryptanalysis, uh, and I've done a lot of cryptanalysis of cryptographic hash functions that are really important for digital signatures. Uh, and recently I've more moved uh, towards the cryptanalysis of what is known as quantum safe cryptography. And that's also the, the topic of this, uh, uh, this lecture, uh, because there is a big change happening in cryptography. Uh, and basically we have the advent of the quantum threat. Uh, and that means that basically all our cryptography, uh, we have to move towards quantum safe cryptography. It has to be secure. Uh, against uh, quantum attackers. So 
but of course, cryptography has become hugely important in our digital digital society, right? It's really in everyday life and for very critical applications. So it really is used to secure banking, uh, our own individual privacy, such as your, your health uh, dossiers. Uh, they also keep industrial uh, secrets uh, from either competitors or uh, 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 other nations, uh, uh, adversarial nations. Uh, it's important for uh, journalism to keep sources uh, secret and to allow for whistleblowing. And of course, it's also very sensitive, uh, in, uh, very crucial to, to uh, engage in diplomacy and strategy without uh, making uh, potential adversaries uh, the wiser. Now, cryptography is a very old field, uh, uh, thousands of years, uh, and in, in, uh, it has been more of an art, uh, but uh, uh, well, uh, we have modern cryptography uh, uh, rising up really as a science uh, in, in the last century. Uh, and what we now view as, as modern cryptography is where we have really rigorous methods uh, to build cryptographic systems where we can prove uh, confidentiality and integrity of communications, uh, however, mostly still under an assumption. So if we can prove it, but still assuming that some uh, kind of problems, mathematical problems are very hard. For instance, something very widely known is that it's very hard to factor large integers. Uh, and that's what we uh, can uh, build uh, uh, encryption on, uh, like RSA. So, but modern cryptography is not allow only about like uh, provable security, uh, and making these assumptions and then prove our cryptographic systems are secure based on these assumptions. It's also very much about cryptanalysis that, that really tests uh, all these constructions that we have, uh, uh, if they are really as secure as we think they are. Uh, and that is also looking at the proofs, if they are, the proofs are completely correct, uh, but uh, uh, assuming these proofs are correct, then there are still two main things. Uh, we can really test these cryptographic assumptions uh, if they are really as hard as problems uh, as that we think. Uh, and if the assumption doesn't hold and factoring large integers is actually quite easy, then we actually have to discard uh, all schemes that are based on this uh, assumption. But even if a problem is not uh, fully broken, fully insecure, then still it's very important for cryptanalysis to look at this problem very hard because we need to know uh, how much computational resources you need for a particular size of the problem, right? So uh, uh, large integer factoring is hard, but uh, if you have a smaller large uh, uh, integer, then that's definitely easier than an even bigger uh, integer, right? So we need to know how big of an integer do we need to use to make sure an attack is really intractable? Uh, and so that's really like uh, we need to do concrete script analysis. Uh, how hard is this problem uh, for specific key sizes? And this is very important because this is how we uh, determine which key size to use uh, for, for our standards. So as I said, the modern cryptography uh, came up the last decade, but uh, even then uh, there was a, a very big change. Uh, like in cryptography before the 70s, we didn't have public key uh, cryptography. That's really came up in, in the 80s. So everything before that, we could only use symmetric cryptography. And symmetric cryptography means two parties can communicate uh, privately and securely if they share the same key. But how do they get the same key, right? So we need to pre-distribute pre uh, keys and that typically requires uh, some kind of uh, physical meeting uh, or a, a physical courier uh, uh, to exchange uh, keys. And that also made it very hard to use, right? And so not everybody used cryptography uh, uh, before the 70s. And this was really more limited towards uh, diplomacy and uh, military purposes. And now today's cryptography uh, really uh, became ubiquitous through the use of public cryptography. And what public key cryptography allows is that any two parties can communicate securely without any prior interaction, and even in the face of an eavesdropper or uh, an attacker. 
Uh, and so what are these, these public key uh, cryptography uh, primitives uh, that made all these uh, possible? Well, we have digital signatures uh, that uh, uh, provide integrity and authenticity of uh, messages. Uh, and this is also what we use to build our uh, public key infrastructure uh, to secure the web uh, and authenticate the websites. Uh, we have public key exchange where any two parties uh, that uh, uh, want to communicate securely can uh, create a shared secret key uh, that is both random and, and uh, short. Uh, uh, even without prior interaction and, and even in the face of an eavesdropper. And then once those two parties have uh, uh, created a shared secret key, then of course they can actually use symmetric encryption uh, and use these short keys to send very long uh, messages, which is definitely more efficiently than uh, to continue use public key cryptography to send the actual uh, messages. So uh, if we look at the, the, our, our public key cryptography that we use today, what are sort of these, these uh, cryptographic assumptions underlying uh, these schemes? And we basically have uh, three main, uh, right? So we have uh, RSA, a very well well known uh, public key crypto system, uh, and that's roughly based on uh, the hardness of uh, factoring, right? So here the secret key is uh, two very large prime numbers, P and Q, and the public key is simply the product. And of course, uh, as factoring is hard, it's, uh, it's assumed to be hard, it's very hard to find the uh, original prime numbers from the product. And other problems uh, that we use in public key cryptography today uh, are the discrete logarithm and the elliptic curve uh, discrete logarithm, which I, I won't get into all these uh, mathematical details. Uh, but what is important to know is that while these are the hard problems that we base our uh, current public key cryptography on, there is a quantum threat. And uh, there's a Shor's quantum algorithm, and that is basically uh, allows to factor integers and has been refined uh, to also solve the discrete logarithm problem and the elliptic curve uh, discrete logarithm problem. So Shor's quantum algorithm running on a quantum computer can break these uh, uh, mathematical hard problems that our public key is based on now uh, can break it uh, completely, which is, of course, a, a really uh, large problem. Um, and then, uh, of course, the National Cybersecurity, uh, the National Security Agency, uh, US, uh, has expressed serious concerns about the safety uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the US. Uh, uh, government uh, systems, uh, and this has drived uh, the US NIST, N National Institute for Standards and Technology, uh, to create a call for quantum safe cryptographic standards. And while this, this threat is, is looming, uh, and we need to move towards uh, new uh, public key cryptography, that is actually quantum safe, is not broken by Shor or any other quantum algorithm. Uh, there is some, some uh, good news is that we actually have several decades of research on such quantum safe cryptography. And uh, these haven't really made into uh, actual deployment yet, uh, or actually recently do, but uh, uh, when this, this uh, threat arised, uh, they weren't actually used yet. Uh, and uh, but there was a lot of research, and so what really only needed to happen was uh, to really push uh, this research into technological readiness, uh, uh, select key sizes, iron out uh, kinks, uh, implement everything, test everything, standardize, and in the, uh, eventually migrate to act to those uh, uh, new public key cryptography uh, systems. So then the question is, when is this quantum threat actually going to happen, right? Shor's quantum algorithm breaks uh, RSA, uh, breaks elliptic curve, uh, but the issue is you really need a quantum computer for that, and not just any uh, quantum computer. You need a generic quantum computer with uh, millions uh, of uh, what are so-called qubits. So we really need a very large scale quantum computer for uh, 
to uh, actually run Shore against our public key uh, crypto systems. And sort of the, the good news is that while well, quantum computers are really uh, actively being developed as we speak, there are several developments, several companies uh, working and research groups working on uh, quantum computers. And uh, uh, if we look at where they are now, uh, they are actually not that far ahead, right? So we're, we're talking uh, so far between 100 and 1,000 uh, qubits. Uh, no, really around the order of uh, 100 uh, qubits. And, but we can already see the roadmaps of these, these companies, research groups, where they aim to be. And if we plot uh, uh, trends uh, through these, these uh, uh, data points that we have, then we, of course, we can scale a little bit to a very optimistic side and pessimistic side. And, uh, in, in this this uh, graph made by by Tino and Lens, uh, you can see somewhere uh, pessimistic would be somewhere close to uh, 16 years uh, that uh, a potential large enough quantum computer can uh, uh, can be ready. In a more optimistic uh, setting, uh, we're really after 2050. So of course the quantum threat looms, and we were, we're everybody's uh, looking at this potential big monster. Uh, but really, so far uh, the quantum threat is known. We know it will be there, but so far it's it's more of a hatchling than uh, a, a full-size monster that wreaks havoc uh, to our public key systems uh, already. So yeah, as, as I already looked, right? So what are these predictions? If you were reasonably optimistic, then this threat might uh, rise uh, around 2050 or later, but already reasonably pessimistic extrapola extrapolation suggests like something like 2039 is, is uh, possible. And uh, since it's pessimistic, uh, it's, it's, it's on one end of the, the uh, possibilities, we might consider this to be a, a certain uh, a low risk, right? So after 2050, it will be a very high risk uh, that there will be a quantum computer. 2039 is the early range, so we, there's a, a reasonably low risk uh, that there is a quantum computer that can break RSA, uh, and that's happening then in, in 70 years. But even if it's a low risk that it will happen, uh, it actually has a very high impact because if it breaks our public key systems, that has is really a very high impact on our uh, digital society. And you can even look further, right? So, so here we extrapolated from actual developments, but other uh, uh, experts, very pessimistic experts, might already think uh, it might happen as uh, 2030. So everything seems still far ahead, right? 17 years. But the problem is, is that the quantum threat already impacts security now in a way that's not immediately uh, obvious, right? And this is because of store now, decrypt later attacks. Because what can like very large nation states do, uh, they can eavesdrop uh, their targets uh, and uh, store all that encrypted data now and just store that data and keep it around. And at the point where they've developed a quantum computer that can actually break uh, the, the public key encryption uh, of that uh, of those uh, information, then they can break it at that time. And that basically means that if information that is processed now and sent now that still needs to be safe in 17 years, then that information is already uh, vulnerable to store now decrypt later attacks. And this is uh, can be, be formulated in sort of a mitigation rule, which is also known as, as Mosca's lemma, right? So if we consider uh, X to be the time that we need to develop and deploy quantum safe cryptography, and you can easily think uh, on the order of 10 years uh, for that amount of time. And if we think of Y as the time 
our information needs to be protected. And for instance, like like health and social security numbers, they really need to be protected for, for more than 10 years. And maybe some other information doesn't need to protect it for that much. But there is certainly information that needs to be protected for uh, a, a large number of years. And then finally, of course, the problem set is the, the time until quantum computers can actually break our public key encryption that we used uh, that we use uh, today. Um, and if the time to de develop and deploy quantum safe cryptography, uh, uh, plus the amount of time that information still needs to protect it, is beyond the time that a quantum computer uh, can actually break uh, uh, elliptic curve or RSA encryption, then our information is not protected enough. We really need to migrate earlier to ensure that the information that needs to be protected is migrated uh, uh, well before uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the quantum computer, uh, yeah, the store now and decrypt later uh, uh, affected. So this is uh, an overview, right? So so uh, this this migration that we need to do to quantum safe cryptography is not the first large scale cryptographic migration that we needed to do. Uh, we can, for instance, look at uh, the migration from DES to AES, uh, the uh, symmetric uh, block cipher uh, migration. But also more recently, we can look at uh, hash functions. Uh, uh, which I was also involved in, uh, because like uh, uh, in 2005, uh, both MD5 and SHA-1 were uh, at least theoretically broken, uh, and then developments for MD5 happened very quickly. Um, and also for SHA-1, developments eventually led to 2017 for the first break, uh, etc. But these developments started in 2005 when MD5 and SHA-1 were theoretically broken. And at that point, it became clear that we didn't know exactly what's, uh, uh, what was going to happen with all our hash function standards. And that's also why NIST, uh, the National Institute for Stick Standards and Technology, started a call for a SHA-3 uh, 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 to standardize SHA-3, so a very new design that is not very similar to MD5, SHA-1 and SHA-2 because they're actually quite similar. Um, and um, so that was all driven by, by, uh, by these uh, attacks on MD5 and SHA-1. Um, now in the end, SHA-3 was uh, uh, ready and standardized, and in the end it appeared SHA-2 was actually uh, secure enough and did not fall uh, to any of these uh, attacks. Um, but still, uh, everybody had to migrate away from MD5 and SHA-1 to uh, SHA-2 uh, or uh, SHA-3. And if we just look at this, this timeline, then, uh, well, SHA-2 was already standardized in uh, 2001, and since 2005 we knew that SHA-1 was weak, but only uh, in uh, in 2017 did browsers stop accepting uh, SHA-1 uh, certificates. So this really took a, a long amount of time before we actually fully switched over to SHA-2 uh, uh, and uh, actually uh, turned off the switch on, uh, on SHA-1 uh, for our web. And you can really easily see that this is this is uh, uh, well from 2005 to 2017. That's about 12 years. So that's it's really a very long uh, time scale for to make such a, a large scale cryptographic migration. Now, how does it uh, look like for uh, uh, the quantum safe uh, cryptography? Well, this uh, started in 2016 when NIST uh, started. Uh, uh, this uh, quantum safe or post quantum crypto project, and they created a call for quantum safe uh, uh, proposals um, with a deadline in 2017. And as I will explain later on, more uh, I will definitely go a lot more into detail about this, this process. But what NIST expects is that these standards will be ready by 2023 or maybe at latest 2025. Um, and that's already cutting it close. Uh, if we look at the uh, 
potential timelines for a quantum computer. And uh, like Moscow, which is, was, was one of the very pessimistic uh, experts, thought there might already be a one in seven chance uh, RSA 2000 might be broken in 2026 and a 50% chance by 2031. Uh, and the uh, European Commission has sort of put a, a flag at 2035. Um, and of course, if we look at the extrapolation of what's are actually developed now, then uh, actually 2039 might be more reasonable. Uh, but yeah, we still have this, this uh, uh, low risk, high impact. Uh, we really want to be on the safe side. Um, but still, we're already quite late until standards are, are ready uh, in comparison to, to how quick developments uh, might go uh, in the quantum computer. So, how am I right? So we're, we're talking about quantum safe cryptography, uh, and there's actually a distinction to make, right? So quantum safe cryptography uh, is cryptography that's safe against quantum computers, but we also have quantum cryptography, and that is quant uh, cryptography that actually uses uh, uh, quantum mechanics itself, right? So so classical crypto that what we could use today is uh, we basically and it is secure uh, today because there are no quantum devices available. So all the users and the attackers uh, uh, are just use classical uh, computers. And quantum safe cryptography, that's what we want to uh, deploy uh, after uh, uh, 2025, um, is where the users can just use regular computers, but it should be secure against attackers that use quantum computers. Um, and finally, and this really needs a lot more development, uh, we can also look uh, somewhere in the future towards quantum cryptography, where uh, quantum uh, devices and networks are ubiquitous as our, uh, uh, well, classical hardware or computers that we use today. Um, but for these quantum devices to be that ubiquitous, we will uh, needs really a lot more time and, and development. So this is really far, far, far ahead in the, in the future uh, where we, we can possibly rely on ubiquitous uh, quantum cryptography. And what there's also a very big uh, difference between quantum safe cryptography, right? That actually runs on, on the classical computers versus quantum cryptography. Uh, because quantum safe cryptography, you know, classical machines gives us symmetric encryption, public key exchange, digital signatures, so uh, all kinds of uh, cryptographic uh, primitives. Um, but to make them quantum safe, we need to build them on new intractability assumptions. And like for public key cryptography, we need to move away from the factoring problem and move towards these new quantum safe uh, problems. Uh, but we still, even in a quantum attacker world, uh, we can still build all these quantum safe uh, cryptographic functionalities. Um, they might be different algorithms, so we might need a software upgrade, but we can still do everything that we do today. But quantum cryptography, that is really more uh, limited uh, what is possible. Uh, two main things are quantum key distribution, so uh, where two parties use a quantum channel uh, to derive uh, a shared secret key, and quantum randomness, where quantum mechanics is used to generate uh, really uh, random uh, numbers. And both of these uh, functionalities actually do not rely on any cryptographic hard problem, at least in theory, uh, because in practice there are definitely a lot of problems because the physical implementation of these uh, systems is not as perfect as issued in theory um, and any imperfections uh, uh, may lead to attacks. And so these imperfections uh, and the level of security you actually achieve with a particular uh, implementation is very hard to certify what their security is, uh, which is definitely a problem. We really want to know how secure we can expect a system to be. But also because these are quantum devices, it really requires new physical infrastructure uh, that needs to be built. And as if you already can compare in these functionalities, the, these quantum functionalities are very 
limited. And actually quantum key distribution might create a shared secret key, but it still requires on uh, authentication. So the channel still needs to be authenticated, and that's where you typically would still use quantum safe cryptography. So you would st still rely uh, uh, on, uh, on classical cryptography. Uh, and of course, these, these physical infrastructure means an increase of costs, uh, significant costs, but also an increase of risks because this creates new uh, failure points uh, and also uh, uh, for quantum key distribution, if you want to cover large distances, you might need repeaters and uh, every repeater is, is a, a vulnerable point uh, itself. So basically the consensus among crypto security fact, uh, experts to really address the quantum threats, uh, the opinion is that we should really focus on quantum safe cryptography and where these quantum uh, cryptography functionalities might be useful in very specific cases, but they do carry a lot of risks that need to be uh, uh, covered. So this is really only for a very specific, uh, uh, only, uh, yeah, uh, only for very specific use cases. This is not for for general purpose. Okay, so we're really going, uh, basically, uh, all the governments are really going to focus on on a quantum safe cryptography, also called post quantum cryptography. Uh, and in this light, NIST has created a standardization process which is an international competition, uh, as we already had two prior international competitions, like for AES uh, and for SHA-3. And this does not mean that the, uh, this means that the uh, cryptographic systems are not developed in-house, uh, in secret uh, in, the, in the US uh, government, but it's calling for submission from uh, uh, international academic and industry teams uh, from all over the world. Uh, and we see really a lot of uh, uh, submissions from, from European and, and US uh, teams. Um, and there's this, this whole process where there are a lot of workshops and interaction with this with uh, the whole of the cryptographic community and not just the submission teams um, to uh, determine what should be the best criteria uh, to evaluate the security of these submissions and potentially look at tweaks of uh, submissions. But in the end, NIST drives the standardization process and uh, actually, will actually standardize it for the US government. So in the end, NIST will decide based on, uh, uh, decides which submissions it will standardize for the US government. Um, so NIST will decide it and, but they will do uh, publish uh, the selection rationale. So how does this process look like? Uh, well, this started in 2017. Uh, at the end of 2017, there was a submission deadline. Uh, there were already 73 candidates. Uh, and over the periods uh, up to early 2019, these, these candidates were analyzed um, by the international uh, cryptographic community to, to look at vulnerabilities. Uh, and then NIST uh, made a significant cut in these uh, candidates. Uh, so that they can be more focused in cryptanalysis. Uh, and so in round two, we only had 28 uh, candidates left. And there was another period of uh, further analysis by the, by the community uh, till uh, mid-2020. And by that point in time, NIST uh, selected basically uh, for round three, seven finalists and eight alternate candidates. So, um, and this is where it already sort of a two track uh, uh, started in, in the standardization process uh, because it really wanted to focus on some early uh, draft standards or some early standards, um, but it might still want to consider uh, other proposals uh, for later standardization. So we have some, some finalists that go for early standardization uh, and there are now alternates that are on basically on a sort of a slow track uh, and might still be standardized, but uh, definitely later than uh, the, the first batch. So uh, uh, July this year, uh, NIST finally 
selected from the seven finalists for draft standards uh, that are actually going to be standardized. Uh, and this will happen over the course of uh, uh, next year and then will uh, be somewhere ready in 2024 uh, where the actual standards uh, will be set in stone and, and published. Um, so there are four selected as these draft standards that will actually be standards right now. And there were four selected from these alternates uh, that also continue on in, in the slow track uh, towards uh, potential standardization. Um, and out of these four alternates, already one dropped out uh, due to a recent uh, development. So which uh, submissions did NIST uh, uh, select? Uh, there are two primary choices. And these primary choices are there's a Kyber that is used for uh, encryption and the lithium that is used for digital signatures. And both of these, uh, these two are actually quite uh, related. They're both uh, uh, based on structured lattices, but also their teams have quite a bit of overlap and also the analysis has uh, a really lot of overlap. So these are the, the really the primary choices that uh, are are suggested for for general use, and um, besides these primary choices, NIST has also selected two more special purpose uh, uh, submissions to be standardized. Uh, one is Falcon, which is also a public key signature system, uh, so for digital signatures uh, based on structured lattices. Uh, and the benefit from Falcon is that it has uh, shorter signatures. So that's more uh, uh, reduces communication uh, in, uh, in our public key system uh, infrastructure. Uh, so for, for uh, secure web connections that might uh, give some uh, savings in communication and uh, latency. But one of the problems for Falcon is that it uses uh, uh, floating point numbers and floating point operations are very hard to secure against uh, side channel leakage. Uh, so that's why Falcon is only suggested to be used for offline signatures where these side channels can be uh, fully mitigated. Uh, and then finally, uh, as a very conservative choice, it also selected things plus which is also a public key signature system, but uh, based on, uh, on hash functions. And this is a very conservative choice uh, and it's still reasonably performing, but it's definitely not as well performing as uh, the lattice based uh, systems. So if, if you look at the selection, uh, here we actually only have now one uh, encryption system uh, to be standardized, that's Kyber, and we'll have three uh, signature uh, standards uh, coming up. And out of these uh, four, three are all based on structured lattices, so almost the same problem, uh, and only one is based on hash based. Now, what about these round four candidates? Um, these are still uh, contesting for, for later standardization. Um, and we have then three systems that are based on uh, uh, error correcting codes, and that's bike. Uh, classic MacLeese and classic MacLeese is uh, basically almost as old as, as RSA, so this is a really well understood uh, system, uh, and HQC. Now there was also a fourth, Psyche, uh, which is, was also a public key encryption system and based on a, a relatively new mathematical problem, uh, which is called, yeah, the isogeny problem, uh, but that was actually broken after it became known it was continuing uh, as a round four candidate. Uh, so this will definitely be uh, dr dropping off from this uh, uh, later standardization process. And as you can see, uh, uh, in, in the first standards, we have three signature systems, but only one encryption system. So the round four candidates, they were actually all encryption systems. Uh, and what uh, NIST will also do is they will uh, uh, call for uh, even more signature, uh, signature systems that are not based on structured lattices and uh, hash based for more diversity, right? So if we look at the, 
uh, six mathematical platforms that we have for quantum safe cryptography, uh, we already saw that the, the upcoming standards, they are based on lattices and based on hash functions. Um, and lattices are really the main winner in this NIST uh, competition because it really provides some balanced performance, right? So if we look at the public key size, the uh, uh, signature size or the ciphertext size, but also the amount of computation that you need uh, uh, on both ends, uh, they all come into play. And for lattices, that really has some, some balanced performance. Um, and the security of lattices uh, really relies on uh, the hardness of finding short vectors in some structured letters. Uh, then we have hash based, which is a very solid uh, uh, and, and conservative uh, problem in cryptography. Uh, it's also very old. Uh, and here the security really relies on the hardness of finding second pre images. Uh, and even that, even though uh, MD5 and SHA1 are broken and we have SHA2 and SHA3, uh, finding uh, pre-images and uh, second pre-images even uh, is still hard, even for these, these broken uh, hash functions, MD5 and SHA1. So for our secure ones, uh, this is definitely very uh, conservative. So this uh, is a very strong platform. Then in the alternatives, Right, so the, the, the main standards that are coming up now are based on lattice and hash based. Uh, as alternatives, we only have then re three remaining alternatives uh, that are all based on codes. Uh, so uh, error correcting codes. Uh, and this is also a very solid and conservative problem. But the main issue uh, with uh, uh, code based uh, uh, quantum safe cryptography it is, is that they have very large public keys. Uh, and this is really the reason why they haven't been selected yet for uh, early standardization. Um, and we also have three other uh, mathematical platforms that definitely have been considered and we have seen submissions, but uh, they haven't been either haven't been performing as well. Or there were definitely some uh, security issues in these uh, constructions. Right, so we have isogenies uh, like Psyche, which was the, the fourth alternate uh, going into round four. It was uh, isogenies are very new and promising, uh, but yes, yeah, I said uh, Psyche was recently broken, so there are still some surprise attacks uh, that, that break important schemes, which is giving how new it is, might not be entirely surprising, but still, uh, uh, yeah, caught uh, people by surprise. Um, and Right, so nowadays we use elliptic curve cryptography and isogenies is a, a higher structure on elliptic curves, um, uh, actually between curves. So you don't stay on one curve, you, you hop between curves uh, and the security relies on finding isogenies between uh, such uh, elliptic curves. We have multivariate, uh, which is also solid and, and conservative. Uh, but we've seen some basic constructions that work well, but don't have very, they have quite bad performance, uh, but adding more structure to get more performance typically leads to more breaks. So that's also quite uh, problematic to get more efficient multivariate schemes. Uh, and the security relies on the hardness of uh, solving uh, not just uh, univariate polynomial system, but multivariate polynomial systems where you have many variables uh, and uh, at least a quadratic degree uh, uh, polynomial equations. And finally, uh, that might not be known as well, but we have submetric cryptography where people need to know uh, the same key to communicate. But if we use uh, combine it with Sigma protocols, we are able to create public key systems from uh, symmetric cryptography. Um, the only problem is, is that the performance is rather similar to hash based and there weren't as many uh, uh, proposals. So uh, that's why the, the focus was now on uh, hash based so far. And hopefully we see in the future, we'll, we'll see more constructions and more diversity uh, other than these, these uh, uh, top three uh, uh, draft standards and alternates uh, uh, currently in the process. So this is a bit of an overview. Um, 
uh, of these these platforms and how they they compare if you look at uh, the public key size right as already mentioned codes have a very large public key size they they perform really bad uh, on that uh, but also multivariate has a rather large public key size but then uh, if you look at hash based and, and uh, sigma based they have uh, larger message or signature sizes which uh, means there's quite a bit big communication cost uh, and that's that's problematic uh, and isogenies have a very big uh, issue with that the computational cost is quite a bit uh, larger than uh, compared to what we currently have on the elliptic curve and, and rsa uh, and as you can see, so mostly lattice, they provide a very balanced uh, picture where there is not one particular area that's very bad, uh, but it's, it's well balanced over all performance uh, metrics. But yeah, and nevertheless, so out of these, these six uh, platforms, we only now have two of them for draft standards. And I think definitely would be very good if we see uh, really a lot more diversity uh, in, in the platforms uh, that we have for, for uh, standards. And that's also why NIST has created a new goal for more signature proposals, because the only uh, uh, yeah, we only have uh, lattice and, and uh, a hash based at the moment uh, and we really want more so this has selected these draft standards right and we can expect to see the actual standards in 2024 and by then we have implementations of these uh, standards and we're basically then ready to deploy right uh, but still there there's good uh, to to uh, uh look at it uh, closer um there is still some risk involved in just immediately uh deploying these new schemes and just uh drop rsa and let up the curve and just completely move uh towards these new uh quantum safe uh, schemes right so what of the, the the two of sort of the risks that are involved well uh these have rather new implementations they're very young and they're not as well studied as our RSA and elliptic curve implementations, especially if we look at uh, uh, hardware implementations, eh? like if you look at smart cards uh, uh, or uh, uh, other types of uh, hardware. Um, and that means, yeah, th these implementations aren't as well understood and there might still be the risk that there will be new types of side channels uh, to be found. Uh, 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 and we really need to know that our implementations are actually uh, secure against uh, potential side channels. And what's the other problem? Well, that's something we've already seen uh, with, uh, for instance, uh, Psyche. Uh, Psyche was based on isogenies, which we know was a relatively new problem and uh, uh, not as well studied as some of the other uh, mathematical platforms. Uh, but still, that it was broken so late uh, in the standardization process was a bit of a surprise uh, and a bit of a wake-up call um, that, well, this happened for a young problem, but even for an older problem, we still might learn something crucial and there is suddenly an advance in cryptanalysis. Um, and particularly if we look at more structured problems, the more structure you add to a problem, uh, well, in theory, it becomes easier to break. This might not always be evident. This might not actually pan out in, in practice, uh, but there's also the, always the potential that adding more structure leads to really a better attack. And if this suddenly happens for our uh, quantum safe systems, well, then uh, we might need to switch to, to bigger keys or maybe even switch to a different scheme. So there are definitely some risks in, in uh, when we start deploying these new schemes and what can we do to cover these risks? Uh, and uh, that is basically to use hybrid schemes. So uh, not using just a single scheme, uh, but uh, we're going to use hybrid cryptography uh, and basically cryptographic combiners uh, that are ways where we can combine two or more schemes into one stronger scheme. And then particularly, uh, it would be very good uh, to combine existing schemes uh, for elliptic curve and RSA, where we really understand the 
uh, side channel resistance of our implementations and the implementation has been very well vetted uh, to combine those implementations with our new quantum safe schemes. And the main property of these cryptographic combiners and this, this stronger scheme is that uh, the, the combined scheme uh, should only be broken if all schemes are broken, right? So uh, we want hybrid cryptography where we really achieve strongest link security. So even if there's a surprise attack against our new quantum safe scheme, uh, for now, then at least uh, uh, ECC or RSA will still provide uh, security for the, for the connection. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, if there is nothing uh, wrong, then our quantum safe schemes will provide security against the quantum attacker. So we uh, really get strongest link uh, security. And I think that's important to uh, work towards. So what can you think? Uh, how do these cryptographic combiners work? Well, for signatures, this is relatively easy uh, because you basically concatenate signatures and you verify uh, individual signatures and you only, uh, uh, you really require that they all are valid instead of at least one. Uh, for encryption, this is definitely a bit more subtle. Uh, uh, so for public key encryption, we typically use public key encryption to encapsulate a symmetric key. Uh, and then we, the idea to, com uh, to uh, a cryptographic combiner for encryption is that each a uh, public key encryption system is used to encapsulate a particular symmetric subkey that are all embedded. And then if you have decrypted them all, uh, you combine all these symmetric subkeys uh, and cryptographically derive a new key. Uh, and also, uh, this is also where you have strongest link security because you can only derive this, this, this new key, the main key that you're going to use uh, to actually encrypt your message. Uh, is if you can break all the public key encryption systems and basically are able to find uh, or recover all these symmetric subkeys. Um, so that's an important concept, hybrid cryptography. Uh, and, but there's also there is one additional risk, uh, right? Because somewhere in the future, so currently we use uh, uh, ECC or RSA public key cryptography. Then we first might switch to a future where we use uh, uh, cryptographic combiners, where we use both elliptic curve or RSA with quantum safe schemes. And then maybe later in the future, we'll just use only uh, quantum safe schemes. So there will be a staged migration and you would have to be aware of downgrade attacks that uh, you will actually use your hybrid scheme instead of being downgraded to only use elliptic curve or RSA. Um, so that's something to be aware of when we implement hybrid cryptography. Uh, so what are now our overall recommendations from the cryptographic community? Uh, so for symmetric cryptography, there is also a bit of impact from, from the quantum attack, but this mainly means that we need to use bigger keys and uh, bigger uh, hash function outputs. But otherwise, uh, there is no, no very big impact as, as for public key cryptography. If we look at public key cryptography, then it's really the, the NIST uh, uh, PQC standards uh, that we need to take in, into account, um, uh, how we need to prepare for those new standards. And that means our systems need to be able to cope with longer keys, longer messages or signatures, uh, but they're also slower to compute, right? So uh, it will increase latencies. Uh, we might need uh, better hardware, especially if you talk about very resource constrained uh, hardware. Um, but these stars are, standards aren't ready now. And if you really have to switch now, uh, the suggestion is to really use conservative defi uh, designs such as uh, Frodo, which is not based on a structured lattice, but on uh, uh, yeah, a more basic lattice uh, without additional structure. Uh, and McAleese, which is really almost as old as RSA, but it is quantum secure. Uh, use Be conservative and use uh, uh, hybrid combiners. Uh, and uh, for the case where you have long-lived systems that can be updated uh, themselves, uh, if you think about satellites or about cards or smart cards, 
these are very hard to update once they're out in the field. Um, uh, the suggestion is to use uh, hash-based signatures, which are very conservative systems uh, to uh, ensure uh, authenticity. And I have reached the end of my uh, lecture. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So I'm um, sorry, I didn't couldn't have a look at the chat during my lecture. So, but I... no problem, sir. Uh, I can read out the questions to you. I will be moderating the Q and A session, anyways. First of all, thank you so much for your expert insights. Uh, I feel like today we truly uh, got a glimpse uh, into uh, the uh, background of the uh, quantum uh, cryptological community. I, I felt um, thoroughly enlightened by your insights and uh, I would like to thank you for that, sir. Now, first of all, uh, we have a question from Siddhara. Good evening, sir. Isn't quantum safe cryptography secure from hacking? What about devices equipped with quantum safe cryptography? I mean, uh, in, in cybersecurity, uh, um... Cybersecurity is more than purely the cryptographic primitive that is used to secure a device, right? So, um, quantum safe cryptography is aimed that uh, the cryptographic methods cannot be broken, even with a very powerful adversary. They will, as, as with most hacks, they typically work around the cryptography uh, and use implementation vulnerabilities to breach uh, these devices. And I think even in the future, when we have quantum safe cryptography, that will still be uh, the case. Um, quantum safe cryptography will protect us, uh, but still you need to, of course, look at the entire attack surface of the device. Uh, and probably quantum safe cryptography will still be the strongest link in this attack surface. Uh, and it's really about other weak points that have to be uh, addressed. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, moving on to Samir's question, what are the hindrances, if any, of mass adoption of quantum cryptography? Ah, so here we're talking about quantum cryptography, right? And then we need to have quantum devices. And these quantum devices means, well, uh, uh, we can already do quantum key distribution with photons but you still need uh, uh, very good receptors and, and devices. So we might need lasers and filters. Uh, uh, and this is not something you can easily uh, uh, put into your phone that we should uh, uh, <laughs> do quantum key distribution between uh, phones and even between laptops, it's hard. We really need very specific infrastructure. And that would, I would see as the, largest hindrance for mass adoption is <laughs> we need to somehow get uh, infrastructure to do quantum key distribution over. These typically are really physical connections uh, like uh, optical fiber. Um, and so it might be possible between two buildings, but yeah, uh, continuing on doing it from one machine in a building to another machine uh, and having lots of computers, uh, I think that's also going to be very hard. Um, so uh, these are all uh, these kind of uh, main issues uh, why quantum cryptography is not a solution, uh, not a global solution and not the main solution uh, to address the quantum threat. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And finally, if you have a question from Murali, now, do we have any downsides? Do we have any downsides to the this standardization process? For example, if NIST finalizes one of the options, will that decelerate the progress of innovation on the rest of options that get dropped? If the selected option fails or breaks later due to identification of a new attack, then we may not have stronger alternatives as the progress on them already slowed down. Do you see this as a real problem or am I being paranoid here? Um, no, I, I, I don't see uh, this particular problem, right? So 
the quantum threat will arise and we already see a rise in when it will be a, a problem. So we need to have a solution before that. So NIST is really driving for the best option that we can currently see uh, to pick as standards and develop them for deployment. And of course, during this process, there's been a lot of research, a lot of analysis. We keep learning more. So when the first standards are there and we start deploying them, we already know how to build better standards, uh, better systems. And that's what's continuing on, right? So NIST doesn't say, well, okay, we're going to give standards in 2024, and that's the end of it. They're now they're really saying, okay, then we have learned more uh, and we'll keep looking at uh, uh, quantum safe cryptography proposals and see what we might standardize. Uh, but there has to be a benefit, right? We won't just consider uh, uh, schemes, there has to be an advantage, right? It either has to be diverse based on a different platform, either it needs to be really perform better on a particular metric uh, or something, or it's it's better studied. It needs to have advantages over uh, uh, the current proposed uh, standards. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your insight, sir. Uh, I believe we ran out of time, uh, but uh, uh, Thank you so much for the valuable contribution to this year's cyber school. Uh, we really hope uh, to host your lecture next year as well. And uh, I'm personally really excited to hear the updates on the various mathematical platforms, uh, which one ends up triumphant. And uh, perhaps uh, by this time of next year, it will uh, already be clear uh, at what point in 2024 uh, the uh, formalized process will be codified. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me and uh, thanks everybody for attending uh, my lecture. Uh, and I uh, hope this will inspire you to, to also do some uh, research in uh, post quantum cryptography, but uh, definitely you will see it used uh, in the near future. Thank you so much, sir.